Hey, thanks for joining us for another module for Fit to Respond, Fit to Retire curriculum for CFCs for Salt Lake City Fire. Uh, this module is going to cover training methods for strength and conditioning and a few more things. Uh, my name is Rob Stafford. I'll be guiding you through this one, and that way you can uh, connect with me if you have any further questions on what we cover in this presentation. Let's get started. Okay, let's go over the objectives we're going to cover throughout this module. We're going to uh, cover the importance of cardiorespiratory fitness first. Then we're going to go into strength and muscular endurance and hypertrophy as well. Uh, talk about the importance of mobility and stability. That'll be towards the end of the presentation. And somewhere in the middle, we'll cover some training methods and protocols for strength and conditioning. And then finally, um, we'll kind of dive in at different points throughout the lecture on firefighter-based programming and specificity for structural firefighting. So in the big picture of our Salt Lake City Fire Department holistic approach with the health and wellness program, uh, this module will fit into the fitness pillar of the five pillars of the holistic approach. However, I believe strength and conditioning can apply uh, very much so to the mental health or, or resilience, essentially. Um, the stronger, the fitter you are, uh, the more mentally resilient um, you can be as well. And there's a lot of studies that show that as well as far as uh, what they're kind of doing with police, fire, and military, um, especially with military coming back from deployment on how that much, how this can help uh, that significantly. And then also this can help the rehab pillar as well because a lot of these movements basically broken down and scalable into what we do for rehab as well. So good movement patterns are good movement patterns uh, regardless of the reason you're doing them. So the references for this material uh, in this module mainly come from NSCA's Essentials of Tactical Strength and Conditioning, the book that we all received. Um, the material covered, according to the syllabus, actually covers quite a bit of chapters of that book. So we're going to go basically 9 through 17 on the chapters. So it would be a good idea as you follow through with this lecture to have your book because I'm going to reference the book quite often. Uh, however, I also reference uh, several studies and references from different strength and conditioning and medical journals, um, and I'll kind of uh, apply those. I won't apply necessarily the exact study, but at places I will. And then, of course, um, I'll add a little bit of personal experience, data, and observations throughout my career, both as a uh, strength coach and a firefighter working on the fitness committee. Um, but uh, most of this is going to be coming from our main textbook and just evidence-based uh, material. Okay, so we're going to dive into cardiorespiratory fitness first. As the book puts it, uh, this is the ability to function aerobically at a high level relies on the ability of the cardiorespiratory system to deliver oxygen to the muscles, coupled with the ability of the muscles to utilize oxygen to produce ATP. So this is an important foundation for pretty much anything that we do, uh, both from a performance and a health standpoint. Now, VO2 max is the most common defining metric for this. This is the way that we can kind of put a quantitative value to this other than just um, feeling and just general performance. And VO2 max specifically is the maximum amount of oxygen used uh, in a given amount of time. So obviously one of our main goals with cardiorespiratory fitness um, from that quantitative value would be to improve our VO2 max, at least to a standard, and we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, and this is in to not only improve performance, but also improve the body's ability to recover. This is kind of one of the main reasons we should really do it. We're not Our job is not necessarily cardiorespiratory based per se, but if we cannot recover from what we do, whether it be job based or workout based, then that's going to be detrimental to not only our performance, but our health. And we can improve this VO2 max as far as the formula goes by improving the actual cardiac output. Our heart rate is not going to increase with improved fitness, but our cardiac output can improve via improving our stroke volume. And that's what it actually is improving um, when we get fitter and when we get more cardiorespiratory fit. Um, aerobic training can also increase muscle capillarization and mitochondria, which can be also be important for not only aerobic fitness, but strength training as well. Now, most studies show that firefighters should have a base level VO2 max of 42 to 45 milliliters per kilogram per minute. This is pretty apparent um, kind of across the board, across the country, including uh, with peak up at the University of Utah or following the same protocol. Now, with untrained individuals, they can expect a pretty significant improvement of 10 to 20 percent with training. However, when you have a trained individual or a trained athlete, 
typically they're only going to expect a 3 to 5% increase. So a lot of recent studies have actually shown due to that, um, that increases in VO2 max do not always correlate with increases in performance. But again, we kind of care about VO2 max, at least getting it to that standard, that baseline standard, in order to have some sort of quantitative uh, value of improvement. The other values that we could use, of course, are improved performance, improved recovery between workouts, between calls, what have you, and then just kind of more subjective uh, response from, from our clients and from our members. So now we're going to go into some aerobic training methods. We're going to dive into the exercise modes first. And in general, with aerobic training, the specificity, at least for structural firefighting, is not as important as for strength training. Uh, this is, again, a generality for, for most individuals. However, if you're training for a sport or for an event on the side, then obviously that the specificity would have a much larger role. But here's some great options for doing aerobic training, and obviously this list is not all inclusive. Now, if you want to talk about specificity for our job, uh, it may, may be a little more applicable to do sled work, for example, or stairs, whether that be sprinted or loaded, um, and those types of things. Hiking, um, especially loaded hiking like rucking, would be would be very applicable um, for our jobs for obvious reasons. However, any of these things apply, especially when you're training for overall just an aerobic base, aerobic conditioning, uh, the ability to recover, and all those things uh, that we'll talk about. So now that we covered the modes, let's dive in further into the methods on the actual methods of what you're actually doing and the styles of aerobic training that you can do. And they're basically, we're going to kind of keep it simple with four categories. Uh, the book kind of dives in intervals a little bit more, uh, which is good. So uh, again, I highly encourage you to read the chapter on aerobic conditioning. But in general, uh, long, slow distance um, would be uh, kind of your general steady conversational pace, typically done for 30 minutes or more. This could be hours long as well. Um, for an, an average structural firefighter, you'd probably want to stay between 30 minutes and, and two hours to be reasonable, again, unless they're training for a specific event um, on their off time. Now, tempo training, this would be a slightly higher intensity, but still a pace that you can maintain for 10 to 30 minutes. So it's going to be faster than your long, slow distance, but um, but still but still an even pace. It's not going to dive into the interval level. Now, with intervals, this can include um, high-intensity interval training, which is HIT, or fartlek style, which is more of your random intervals. And in general, whether, you, whether you're talking about any of the three, basically it's a very high-intensity pace for anywhere between 5 and 90 seconds. It's a pretty big span here, but followed by periods of rest. Now, those periods of rest could be a 1 to 1 ratio all the way up to a 1 to 5 ratio, depending on what you're trying to do and, and the, the uh, length of the work part of the work rest ratio. And then finally, repeated sprints. This is kind of borderline between, I would say, between aerobic training and I would say it would err on the far more on the edge of uh, anaerobic training, if not even strength training and power training and some. But uh, the, regardless, the book um, kind of puts it into this category. So this would be maximal 100 percent effort. So you're talking shorter sprints. Think about a 50 meter or 100 meter sprint, but then also followed by maximal recovery. So because of that maximal recovery, that's why it dives more into the anaerobic, more into the power training than truly aerobic. However, uh, repeated sprints can be uh, very beneficial for improving your overall aerobic capacity. Let's talk about some of the progressions and basically the variables that you have to play with when you're talking about aerobic training. So first off, we can play with the frequency. So this would be the amount of sessions per training cycle or per week. So how many times you're running per week or how many times you're cycling per week or, or whatever. Uh, also, you can change the intensities. So this would be the rate of exertion based on either the percentage of their heart rate. So there's some formulas on that on page 407 in the textbook or on rate of perceived exertion. So uh, typically, which is done on a one to 10 scale, 10 being an absolute all out effort, one being essentially sedentary. So you can kind of do intensity based on a, a very quantitative value or a qualitative or subjective value. And then also you can play with the duration. So this would be the total amount of aerobic training time done per session. So as you put all these pieces together with aerobic training, the key to remember is that all these methods work well. Again, unless you're training for something specific, if we're talking about training for the job of structural firefighter, all of these uh, methods should have a role. And so it's important to just experiment, change methods at times. But I think one of the biggest values here, the biggest thing to remember is what will allow for the most compliance? What is the member 
actually going to do. If you, if long, slow distance is, is doable and you can get them on a strength training program with some long, slow distance following or on the off days, and that's what they're going to do, but they absolutely will not do high intensity intervals or you don't anticipate those intervals being actual maximal efforts. Well, then there's your answer of what's probably going to work best for that individual. If somebody's more all in and they're willing to do any and everything, we'll then play around with the different methods and make sure there's that each one of those, um, methods has a role that intervals are played in there that sometimes sprints are in there sometimes the long slow distance because they're all good and they all work it's just a matter of being consistent of course and and knowing when to do one thing over the other Um, but in general the, the good thing about aerobic fitness as compared to strength and power per se is that it improves relatively quickly um compared to the other um the other types of training if you will and so that's that's the good thing um people may claim that they're never going to be aerobically fit, but most of the time it's just because of lack of consistency. Uh, the body actually adapts fairly well to aerobic training. And then if you want to dive into this a little deeper and to get more specific on actually the layouts of, 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 of aerobic training, and we'll tie this in a little bit up again toward the end of this presentation, but I'd, I'd look at table 14.2 on page 409. They kind of go in deeper into the, some parameters for aerobic training and how you might lay it out over the, the course of a week. Okay, so we're going to shift gears here a little bit and go into the importance of strength and strength training in general. Uh, this first quote, I absolutely love it. Um, I use it in recruit school all the time. Absolute strength is the glass. Everything else is the liquid inside the glass. The bigger the glass, the more of everything else you can do. And this quote actually came from Brett Jones, but was made famous by uh, Dan John, who's a, a really popular strength coach and uh, one that I will uh, reference in the future here. Um, also, this was a, another quote out of a study uh, that was done in 2007. Um, basically, at the end of the study, they were studying uh, firefighter performance. At the end of the study, they made this conclusion that strength was the only significant physical ability predictor of subsequent firefighter task performance for most measures. And so this was a really powerful um, quote, I thought, and, and the important, showing the importance of strength, particularly with our job with structural firefighting um, and now all of these things, you know, aerobic training, strength training, mobility and stability, they all, of course, play a role. But um, we, I think we need to put a priority on strength and absolute strength, actually, um, for most of our individuals and most of our members, uh, because it is that important. So a really important thing about strength is that we can actually decrease our rate of perceived exertion for firefighting tasks and any daily activity, meaning the stronger you are, the relatively easier everything else becomes. So therefore, you can repeat those bouts more often. You can recover more often from any given skill. That could be throwing a ladder. That could be pulling a hose. That could be picking up a heavy patient. And we know our patients are not getting lighter these days. And that's a fact. Um, And so we need to be strong to be able to overcome all of these things that we're doing and to be able to recover from all of these things that we're doing. And that way, as everything becomes relatively easier with improved strength, then your work capacity will go up, meaning you can go longer, recover easier, uh, those types of things, and your risk of injury will be significantly reduced because you will, those loads will not be as imposing on your body. And with good movement patterns and with strength, your, your risk of injury will go down significantly. So now we know how important it is. Let's talk about some ways to improve strength. There's basically two main ways. So one way is improving strength by increasing neural pathways and the neuromuscular coordination between essentially our CNS and our muscular system. So this is basically seen when we're doing those maximal loads with compound movements. And we'll kind of dive into this a little bit further. But this is also seen with novices. So anytime you introduce resistance training in general to somebody who has not done it, typically the reason they're making those improvements so fast are by these neural pathways, these neuromuscular coordination, not necessarily because they are physically getting bigger or physically getting stronger. It's more of a a CNS reason, at least for the first several weeks. Now, the other way strength is improved is through morphological adaptation. So we could be increasing the number of muscle cells and or increasing the size of the muscle cells. So this is basically hypertrophy, essentially. So let's dive into strength principles and basically categorizations of strength. First, we'll talk about absolute strength. So this is the maximal amount of force that a muscle or muscle group can generate at a specific velocity. So this is really important for structural firefighting and more important than relative strength because the job and its task are very absolute. 
Uh, the latter weighs with the latter weighs. The hose weighs what the hose weighs. A patient weighs what they weigh. And so because this, because our job is very absolute in its tasks and in its loads, the greater our absolute strength is within reason, uh, the better off we're going to be. Now, another component is power. So this is the rate of doing work where work is force times distance. This is essentially applying strength um, with speed, essentially. Now, hypertrophy. So this is an increase in muscle size due to both mechanical and metabolic growth factors. So although this is kind of sometimes there's a negative connotation with hypertrophy, um, not not for many, but especially in the in kind of the functional fitness um, realm, um, and, and it's referred to as bodybuilding many times, which it is. Um, however, hypertrophy is a very important component of strength, and it's really good for what we call building armor. So again, going back to it's not only is it a component of actually building strength, but just building that armor around your joints, building that armor in general on your structure, um, because sometimes with our jobs, mass moves mass. And so um, again, within reason, it's good to have that armor to, to help with uh, reduction of, of injuries and and, and just being able to overcome the loads and the forces that are put on our body through our job. And finally, we have muscular endurance. So this is a muscle's ability to contract repeatedly against a submaximal load in a given period of time. And although this is a very important component of firefighter strength and conditioning, uh, going back to what we talked about with absolute strength and the importance of strength, this this can actually be improved with improved absolute strength by again reducing that RPE or that rate of perceived exertion. So if your if your absolute strength improves and that submaximal load range increases, then therefore you're going to have greater muscular endurance over a larger span of of movements and and loads. Now, much like we did with aerobic training, let's go into the strength training variables and progressions that we can play with. So first off, we'll talk about intensity. So this would be, for strength training purposes, this would be the load or the weight as relative to a one rep max. So for example, if you're working with a weight that's 95% of your one rep max, which meaning the highest weight you can lift for one repetition for that movement, that would be considered high intensity. Whereas 60% of a one rep max would be considered a low intensity for strength training purposes. Now intensity can also be uh, manipulated through the amount of rest between sets and our exercises. And we'll talk about that here in a second. Uh, so in general, intensities as low as 60 to 65 percent of one rep max can still produce gains and increases in strength for most novices. However, as you get more trained, uh, trained athletes need more of a, an intensity of 85 percent and higher for those absolute strength gains. Now, while we're talking about intensity, let's do a little side note here on one rep max. So the one rep max is the amount of weight one can lift for one repetition for any given movement. So this is a maximal effort they cannot lift anymore for one repetition. Now, trained athletes can actually test this by ramping up and essentially going until failure. This is typically done for competition or at the end of a training phase or a training program or something like that. But novices and most individuals more often should use an estimated one rep max formula or there's some good charts out there that are pretty accurate. So, uh, but a good formula that works well is one rep max is equal to the reps times the weight lifted times 0 0.033. Then you take that value, you add it back to the weight that you lifted for those reps, and that'll get you uh, pretty close to your one rep max. And then for intensity purposes on goals, now you can, uh, you can have at least an estimated one rep max to work off of. So we'll take a little aside here on rest intervals since this, this is one of the ways you can manipulate intensity. Now, you can manipulate intensity through those rest intervals, but in general, here's some parameters to follow when you're applying rest intervals to certain goals. So um, with strength and power, we want longer rest intervals. We want a more of a, a maximal recovery. So typically, rest intervals of two to five minutes, maybe even more, um, especially for movements like deadlifts and squats. Um, now for hypertrophy, so gaining muscle size, uh, that's, that's more of a 30 to 90 second rest interval. And the reason those are a little bit shorter is because uh, we're kind of with the hypertrophy, you're kind of tapping more into the metabolic realm a little bit, where strength and power is more of the mechanical realm. So tapping into both of those ways to add strength and add muscle. And then with muscle endurance, typically you're going to go even 30 seconds or less. So we're talking about higher repetitions per set, but less total sets. So a lot less rest, uh, lighter loads there. And we'll dive into those uh, those things in a minute as well. 
Now, another variable that we can manipulate and progress is volume. So volume is the total work done is the actual what they call the training volume. So this is the total work per session or per cycle. So in general, this would be like your sets times reps for any given workout. Now, volume load, then you'd multiply that total volume or that training volume with, with the load. So if you actually want to know how much total load was lifted in that session, that's some ways that some people can keep track um, of their volume as well. Now, in general, lower volumes per set and per session are done for absolute strength. So this would be in the realm of one to five repetitions, whereas higher volumes per set and per session are done for hypertrophy and muscle endurance. And then finally, the last variable that we'll talk about is frequency. So this is the amount of training sessions per cycle or per week. Or it could also be talked about with the amount of times a muscle or movement is trained per cycle or per week. So with untrained individuals in general, you can, they can benefit very well from as little as two to three training sessions a week. However, again, with trained athletes, they may need more frequency depending on their volume intensity and depending on the movements uh, that we're talking about and the goals that they have. So now we'll try to bring all these principles and goals together and kind of match these variables with their goals. So we'll start with absolute strength again. So in, these are all generalities, of course, but for the average individual, if you for goals of absolute strength, if you keep it somewhere in the realm of two to six sets of one to five repetitions, typically they're working at 85% or more um, based on their one rep max. Now, again, for novices, this can come, to, come down significantly, but that's only going to last for the first several weeks to maybe several months, and then they're going to have to start getting up into that, that higher percentage of the one rep max, again, in order to gain absolute strength. So this would be more of the mechanical side of things, more of the neurological, uh, the, the neuromuscular side of things. Now, this would be done, uh, remember, with two to five minutes rest between sets, and in general, this would be two to five times per week. So that's the, that's where we tap into the frequency or per microcycle, which we'll dive into on, on what that means here shortly. So for absolute strength, sometimes these can be very uh, technique driven movements as well. So therefore the frequency might go up a little higher for those types of movements, especially with trained individuals. Now for power, uh, this is a uh, kind of a close cousin to absolute strength, but just trained slightly differently. So we're going to be in three to five sets of, again, one to five reps. And now the the percentage of one rep max on this can be kind of all over the place, varying on the movements that you're doing. So this would be anywhere between 30 and 80 percent of your one rep max or just kind of more subjective maximal efforts when you're talking about plyometrics with body weight or medicine ball work. So a power could be something as simply as uh, adding speed to a squat with a lighter barbell, or it could be something like Olympic lifting movements like the snatch or the clean and jerk, or it could be, uh, like we talked about with plyometrics, medicine ball throws, those types of things. So typically for power movements or plyometrics, we want complete rest between sets. So it's not necessarily time, just where you have that complete recovery so you can do another all-out effort. And we're going to do about two to five times per microcycle, so for a week for the average individual. Um, and again, because some of these can be with Olympic lifting, they're very technique driven, therefore higher frequency. With things like jumps, you may only have to do it twice a week or even less. Now with hypertrophy, we're gonna go stay with about three to six sets of six to 12 reps, so a little higher repetitions with hypertrophy. And we're gonna work in about a 60 to 80% range of your one rep max as far as your intensity and we're going back to that 30 to 90 second rest between sets and then the frequency is a little less for hypertrophy most of the time and this is and this is per body part when you're talking about hypertrophy not necessarily uh, per session so this would be two to three times per cycle and then finally with muscle endurance Again, less sets, higher reps. So two to three sets of 15 reps or more. So this could go all the way up into the 20s, 30s, that type of thing. And so therefore, because of the volume being higher, the intensity has got to be less at about 30 to 50% of your one rep max. Or a lot of times muscle endurance type movements are associated with body weight. So push-ups, body weight squats, lunges, those types of things. So um, it doesn't have to be one rep max uh, uh, driven. And then again, like we talked about with rest intervals, 30 seconds rest or less, 
uh, between sets and you can go anywhere between two to five times per cycle. And the reason this is so vague on the frequency, again, with muscle endurance, when you're talking about body weight exercises, people could literally do them every day without overtraining and without any kind of uh, problems with recovery. Um, so that, that could be a much higher frequency there as opposed to movements with a barbell or dumbbells. You may only have to do them twice a week, uh, like kettlebell movements are popular for muscle endurance, kettlebell swings, those types of things. So based on what we just talked about, here's a few examples. So let's say we want to train the back squat for absolute strength. So we're going to be working in the intensity range of 85% uh, of our one rep max. We're going to do five sets of three reps with that uh, two to five minutes of rest in between those sets. And then we're going to hit this about two to three times per week. So this would be, again, for the average individual, this could be novice or even advanced, uh, could, could fall into the same realm. And then let's say, for example, we want to train the for upper back hypertrophy. So this could be a row, for example. Uh, we're going to work around the 70% uh, intensity level. We're going to do three sets of 10 reps, a little less rest between each set, and we're going to hit this twice per week. So those are just a couple of examples on kind of kind of putting all these things together. Um, you could also see table 15.4 in the book for a lot of goal-based uh, variables as well. As we start to wrap up, variables and start to dive into programming, it's important to remember that when you're making advances in programming, you only want to change one variable per session per exercise for an individual. So, for example, you wouldn't want to assume that somebody from week one to week two is going to increase their volume, their intensity, and their frequency. Uh, that essentially, that's not sustainable. It could lead to overtraining and, and reduced recovery and essentially burnout and noncompliance as well. So, you may change more than one variable uh, going session to session or week to week, but as one goes up, another one might have to come down. So, for example, if you start increasing the weight on the bar, for example, or the intensity, then the total volume is probably going to have to to decrease to make up for that. Now, all this is, is saving maybe the novice um, who in the first couple of weeks can essentially increase everything, but just because they can do it doesn't mean it's right to do it. So, um, when in doubt, kind of be a little bit more conservative on changing variables and think about the end game, the long term strength takes time and so it's good to do one variable at a time now before we dive into further programming let's talk about some strength principles that the book dives into and just to give us a better understanding of some things we need to know and understand before we can actually program uh, for somebody and, and assume progress within strength training so first thing is the principle of progressive overload so this states that Workouts and strength variables must continue to increase and become more difficult in order for the body to continue to adapt and improve. So again, going back to at some point in time, the intensity is going to have to increase. The volume is going to have to increase and or the frequency is going to have to increase. Now, they may work in steps. They may work in waves, those types of things. But ultimately, in order for the body to keep improving and adapting, that has to happen. There's also a principle of specificity. So training adaptations are specific to the imposed stimulus. So if you want to get better at picking stuff up, well, then you should probably practice picking stuff up within reason. You know, it doesn't mean picking up a dummy all the time to practice picking up a person. There is um, there is a benefit to deadlifting something as opposed to having to do the exact skill. But the closer you can get to that skill, obviously, the better off you're going to be. So we want to train muscles and movements that are specific to our job and our tasks that we have to do. So we'll take this little side note here on specificity since we're talking about it. And we're going to dive into movements and exercises a little bit later in the presentation. But here's some movements that are valuable for structural firefighters. There are also some really good tables in the uh, book, 17.2 uh, and 17.3, that I would look at if I were you. That really dives into this as well. One of them actually goes so far as to say indoor movements versus outdoor movements based on firefighting tasks. So it's, it's pretty good stuff. But in general, you can't go wrong with these with these basic movements. So we should be able to squat. So this could be a back squat or front squat, goblet squat, belt squat, box squat, and you could all you could include lunges and step ups essentially. And for those that um, need unilateral work or just for some reason cannot squat, um, so that would fall into that category. A deadlift or a hinge, basically a hinge type movement, uh, would be a major movement that we need to do for pretty obvious reasons. But this can be a conventional barbell deadlift, sumo deadlift with a barbell lifting kettlebells or sandbags, something of that nature, or that you could kind of include um, uh, power cleans in this as well. 
um, and then a press. So that could be a horizontal or vertical press. I would say for uh, structural firefighting, a vertical press and overhead press would be a little more uh, functional. But um, you can there's a lot to be said for uh, building a big bench press that adds an overall upper body strength. Um, a pull in general. So this could be a pull up, a vertical pull, a horizontal pull like a row, um, a curl or a hang clean, something like that, um, or all of the above for that matter um, would be good for a pulling movement. And then carrying stuff. This is something that's often overlooked, very easily trained, very uh, reduction in technique. Um, so it's 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 easy to do and easy to coach. But this could be farmer carry, so holding heavy things at your sides, a bear hug like holding a sandbag or a dummy. A zercher carry with a barbell basically in the in the crook of your elbows, like as if you're also carrying a, a person or something like that or a piece of equipment or put throwing something over your shoulder, something like that. And just basically walking with it. Um, it's it's really, really good for work capacity, trunk stability, those types of things, conditioning as well. And then, of course, dragging something. Again, obvious reasons here, but that could be a sled drag or a push. I think most stations have prowlers now. And then uh, you, or you could drag a dummy, sandbag, those types of things. And then groundwork. This is another very uh, overlooked uh, thing that a lot of people don't do. However, again, for obvious reasons, we should probably be familiar with getting on the ground and moving, especially not that we do it every day, but when it comes time to do it, it's an extremely important movement to do. So we should not only be proficient at it, have it, at it, have the mobility to do it, but also be able to do it very efficiently as well. So um, this could this could include bear crawls, any type of animal movements, type crawls, uh, Turkish get-ups with kettlebells or dumbbells are great for this type of stuff too. Or you could even kind of classify burpees or up-downs uh, in this as well, basically just being comfortable getting on the ground and getting back up. Okay, so now diving back into some other principles, let's talk about adaptive potential. So this is the ability to have a training response to external loads in the program. And this is affected by many things like genetic predisposition, the current training status or your training age, if you will, uh, your age, your actual age, your health, and your lifestyle. So this is the, these are things important to remember when you uh, program for somebody that all these things are affected. Now, although the job is the job, as we say, um, and we have to train to that standard and that level, we still need to, as we program for somebody and talk about volume and intensity and those types of things, we still have to take in these things into account um, based on their adaptive potential. And then there's the stimulus fatigue recovery adaptation theory. Now, the book dives into this a little bit more than I'm going to right now, so I encourage you to look at that. Uh, this is seen in figures 10.2 and 10.3. Um, and, and many other realms, this is referred to as the stress recovery adaptation. They're basically talking about the same thing. So this meaning that you're providing a stimulus or a stress, if you will, when you're working out. You have a, a state of fatigue in which you need to recovery. So there's going to be a fatigue, you have recovery, and then you adapt. And then when you, at, at the appropriate timing, apply a new stimulus or a new stress, then you have super compensation and therefore you get stronger. So there's this cycle and it's a matter of finding the cycle that works for the individual as to take them up. So meaning if they're still in the fatigue or recovery mode and you apply another stimulus or another stress, they are not going to supercompensate. They're going to lead to overreaching or overtraining. Um, however, if done correctly, and that's why we talk about all those variables and how to apply them to the goal, then when done correctly, you have supercompensation and ultimately adaptation, which is what we want. So finally, a few more principles here. We'll talk about variability. So this is altering the training stimulus through either exercise selection and or periodization. And we'll dive into periodization here momentarily. But um, this is important, although it's kind of countering specificity in some ways, it's important because if we tend to do the same things over and over and over again, the body has an amazing way of adapting. And adapting can be good when uh, going back to that um, stress recovery adaptation. However, if it's adapting too much, you're not going to get as much of a training stimulus. It's going to take way too much volume or way too much intensity uh, with the same movements to have that adaptation, that desired adaptation. So therefore, sometimes it's good to, through exercise selection or periodization, to uh, change things up a little bit. So therefore, you can have a, uh, a better training stimulus and one that's more efficient, essentially. Now, periodization is one way of doing this, and this is a logical method of planning training interventions in a sequential and integrated fashion in order to maximize training-induced physiological and performance outcomes. So this is basically kind of what we'll kind of dive into here is taking a year and planning it out and having phases to focus on particular goals, maybe over others. 
Yes, let's dive into periodization. So as we move through periodization and uh, some of the terms here, we're going to start from kind of a wider lens and then go down and, and narrow it as we go and, and dive into the actual training session. But um, overall, periodization is going to start with an annual training plan. So regardless if you're doing a very specific periodized program, it's important to have an, an annual training plan based on your goals. You can also call this annual training plan a macro cycle as well. Or, or the macro cycle could be the year itself. And so this could all revolve around an event that that person has, um, be it on the job or off the job, or it could just be any given amount of time, uh, a calendar year, what have you. And then you're going to want to set up these goals. These goals could be from the individual and what they have for themselves or based on events, or this could be some from, from fitness assessments, from TPT, from the peak e exam, anything. Um, this could, regardless of, uh, of what it is, you want to make sure and lay those out. And then ultimately, you can be laying out blocks of time to meet that goal. And now it's important to remember, regardless of the goals they have, especially off the job, that firefighters, we need to be generally physically prepared. So this is referred to as GPP. So it's important to remember that. So that maybe somebody's training for an Ironman, for example. However, they still need to do their job as a structural firefighter. So just keep those things in mind as you set up their annual training plan. Now, as we dive deeper into periodization, we're going to start to segment that annual uh, training plan or that uh, that macro cycle. So now we're going to go into mesocycles. So these could be referred to also as blocks. So these are generally periods of two to six weeks where the focus of training is on a particular training goal or response. So these could be meaning uh, something like working towards muscular endurance, one block, and then moving to hypertrophy and then on to strength and ultimately on to power, which is a, a kind of a common way of doing it that we'll kind of speak on. But this, it, it all depends on the individual and what their ultimate goal is. But you want to uh, segment this down into blocks so that way you're working on specific things that can meet their ultimate goal. As we talk about mesocycles, here's some foundational blocks that are kind of popular um, throughout time. This has been done for a long time, I think originally coming from kind of Russian uh, strength science essentially, but uh, the accumulation block is generally like a ramping up of volume and intensity, and it essentially lays a foundation. So um, it, it provides a good, a lot of times this is associated with higher volumes, hypertrophy, those types of things. Then there's the transmutation block. So this would follow accumulation. This is typically a shorter block, sometimes reduced loading, and sometimes maybe just a shift in focus. So possibly they're becoming more specific. So for example, Olympic weightlifter, the accumulation phase might be just more generalized strength building, maybe some hypertrophy transmutation. They start working with overall less volume, but more specificity into the Olympic lifts, just as an example. And then finally, the realization block, this would follow the other two, and this would be a much shorter block of one to two week, where they're really uh, maintaining their intensity and frequency, but significantly reducing volume typically. So this would be almost like a not quite a taper, but just a final ramp up into uh, optimizing performance for either a competition or a uh, maybe a one rep max type thing at the peak of a program. Or for tactical uh, athletes, this could be an operation or something that they're that they've been training for. So um, that would be the accumulation, transmutation, realization. This would be kind of those foundational blocks that that have been kind of uh, done throughout time of periodization. So we'll go into a few types of periodization uh, that have worked well and been successful and just some common ways of setting it up. So linear periodization is one. It's kind of a classic style where you start with higher volume and lower intensities. So that kind of hypertrophy block that we spoke of and you progress towards lower volume and higher intensity. So culminating with a strength and or power block. This is a style that we've used uh, successfully in the last three years with the Recruit Strength and, Strength and Conditioning Program. So week one, we're literally learning the movements. We start with the higher volume, therefore, um, especially those that are novices with barbell movements, for example, or kettlebell movements, whatever, um, they, they literally get more practice because every repetition is a practice rep. So their loads are higher, or the, I'm sorry, their loads are lower, so therefore, uh, reduction of injuries possibility there. They're getting more repetitions, which means more practice, and then they're kind of getting more hypertrophy out of it. And then as you progress through, they, uh, they're they working with higher intensities, higher loads, but yet they're more practiced, and they can kind of realize that absolute strength. Now, I will say this is a different than linear progression. Sometimes you hear about linear progression. Um, that is not necessarily periodization at all. Linear progression would refer to as you're doing the same volume and the same frequency, but you are increasing the intensity from session to session. Now, that can be very um, uh, 
advantageous and very successful, especially for novices, but periodization is a little bit different than the linear progression. Now, another type of periodization that has been much more common in recent years is daily undulating periodization, or DUP. This model varies in intensity and volume throughout each microcycle or each week, if you will. So for an example, you could have the first training session of the week would be a heavy max strength type effort, uh, regardless of the movement. That's kind of the intent of the session. And then the next session uh, later in the week would be a hypertrophy focus. And then finally, another session in the week, maybe lighter, low volume efforts for speed. Um, so this would be something where it's, where it's changing literally within the week but yet then the next week you would do that same cycle again. Um, now, a lot of the, the recent studies have shown that this can actually be very advantageous and maybe even superior for tactical populations. Um, and also taking into mind that especially um, structural firefighters may be more so than uh, military where they may actually be training for an operation where more of the classic periodization might work. Whereas for us, uh, we have to, any given day, any given moment of any given shift, we're gonna have to do uh, within a large scope of our job and, and have to perform. And that goes back to that GPP. So uh, DUP can be good for that from a programming standpoint. So we've talked about macrocycles, moved into mesocycles or blocks. Now we're going to talk about microcycles. So typically these are uh, within two to 14 days, but a week being by far the most common for most of the population. However, for us as operations firefighters with the 4896 schedule, a six day microcycle would be best. So if, if the member you're working with is a day a support personnel, then a week microcycle would probably be most advantageous. Whereas if it's an operations firefighter, a six day microcycle would be a good one to, to work off of. Now, beyond the microcycle, now we're going into the training session. So this would be actually a single workout. Now you could also term have a term called the training day. So you may have multiple sessions in with any given training day. For example, you may have a strength session, and then later in that same training day, you'll have a an aerobic session. So that'd be two training sessions within a training day. And it's kind of semantics, but just so we kind of get all of the uh, the nomenclature for periodization out of the way. As we start to bring all this stuff together, all the variables, the principles, and periodization, it's important to understand integrating these training factors. And as we prepare and organize the training year, the mesocycles, the microcycles, that we need to understand the goals and that if the goals are compatible and these training factors are compatible. Now, there's a really good table, uh, 10.5 in the book for compatible training factors, but just an example is if somebody was to tell you that they're training for a marathon, but they also want to increase their one rep max in their squat, that's probably not the most compatible training factor. Now, it doesn't mean they can't do both. Uh, they just have to maybe prioritize one over the other, or you break it down into mesocycles or maybe um, even two different macro cycles within the year based around those events, and then it's maybe doable. And again, for novices, they could probably they can improve aerobically, absolute strength, hypertrophy, they can maybe improve in all of those things. Um, however, that's that's very short-lived phenomena. So um, you need to kind of think about those compatible training factors when you're talking about goals with the member you're working with and programming for that. So now let's start diving into the microcycle themselves and some possible ways that you could set that up. So um, and the, and the book refers to many of these things as well, but these are pretty tried and true uh, ways and methods of doing this. So first off, you have full body workouts. So this is great for novices in general, but really, honestly, quite a quite a few people could be uh, successful in this, especially those that maybe haven't done it in a long time or maybe have never tried it. Um, you can find a lot of success with this because there are some advantages. But this is generally when you do full body workouts, you're doing two to three sessions per microcycle, per six day microcycle, for example. So as I said, this works good for novices or anybody who struggles with higher frequency. So if they feel like they need more recovery time, maybe an older population would uh, would benefit well from this. But again, even the individual that maybe has done um, a lot of bodybuilding style splits for years, they go back to full body workouts where they have a little bit more recovery, can have a little bit more volume in that session and really tap into the full body where you get some of that hormonal response um, and, and just some more absolute strength kind of training. It can be really advantageous for that as well. So um, but when you do these full body workouts, obviously you can't 
most people don't have time for two to three to four hour workouts. So you kind of have to prioritize the movements. And in doing that, you should probably center around those compound movements that are more important for us um, or, or for whatever goals they have. So kind of going back to those major pillars of the squat, hinge, push, pull, carry. As a matter of fact, if you basically pick one, maybe two movements from each of those categories, there's your workout and then maybe slightly change it for the other one or two sessions in that week, or maybe don't change it at all and change it on a monthly basis or on a mesocycle basis. Uh, that's a great way to to set it up. Um, this, there's some classic examples of kind of old time strong men, power lifters and bodybuilders, and and kind of back in the day, a lot of the strong uh, the strong individuals of those times were good in all three of those things, and they had a lot of success with this style of programming. Um, the great one, Arnold Schwarzenegger, actually started his career doing these types of workouts, and then when he was uh, enhanced and a little bit more um, uh, recognizable, that's when he kind of started doing more of the bodybuilding splits. So uh, a great option for a lot of people, um, and so something to certainly consider when you're setting up the microcycle. Now, another great option, especially for uh, an operations firefighter for that that six day microcycle would be an upper lower four day split, or you could possibly do it as a push pull four day split. So this is where you break it down into two upper body focus sessions or pull uh, focus sessions and then two lower body focus sessions or maybe push um, per microcycle. And so what this allows for is greater volume per session per movement or body part. Um, but it would be reducing the frequency just a little bit as compared to a full body. So, for example, you may be squatting, uh, doing a squat movement twice a week versus three times a week, but you can have greater volume, perhaps greater intensity as well with more recovery um, between those sessions if you do it this way. So um, a, a good way to set it up would be doing two, an upper body day and a lower body day at the station or a push day and a pull day at the station, a day off, and then another do that again, a day off, and then therefore there's your cycle right there. So it's kind of a two on, one off as far as work to rest kind of days. Um, but you can really break down the body a little more and, like I said, apply a little bit more of that volume per session. And there's some really popular examples out there, and they all work really well. Uh, Windler's 531 is a really popular one that's out there that essentially is, is going off of this foundation. Uh, the Juggernaut math Method is another close resemblance to that. The four-day heavy light split, which is kind of a starting strength uh, practical programming type method that works really, really well. And then, of course, the, the conjugate system, uh, west side type method, is also based on the same premise, essentially, where you're having, you're having four sessions in any given microcycle, so be it six or seven days. So one final way that we're going to talk about to set it up would be the body part splits. We kind of referred to this a little bit earlier. We'll, we'll dive in a little deeper. So this is generally five to six sessions per microcycle. So this would be greater overall frequency for those that are able to get to the gym more often, but yet a, slight, a significantly reduced frequency per movement or body part. So you can add a lot more volume. Most likely a lot more intensity is going to be required in order to get a training stimulus when you're not going to work that movement or body part for a whole another six or seven days. So um, those things have to be accounted for. Um, in general, though, this is this is a little bit more successful and popular for, quote, enhanced athletes. So those that are uh, basically taking drugs is what we mean by that. And so this was made famous by bodybuilding magazines and professional bodybuilders, especially in the 70s, 80s and 90s. So, however, we all know now that they are taking steroids. So um, it, when you when you are enhanced and you have the ability to recover a lot a lot better and and you can actually apply the stimulus the volume the intensity that you need to do with such low frequency then this is this can be a successful program now not to say that any other individual can be successful with this because of course they can everybody reacts a little bit of different to to training and how they recover and how they respond so it's certainly an option especially if you have time every day to get to the gym, but yet not much time when you're there. This is a good way uh, possibly to do that. But I would I would say most people are going to be more successful on one of the other two microcycle setups in general. So now that we've talked about the microcycle, let's dive into the actual training session itself and how to set that up. So, um, and the book dives into this uh, quite extensively as well, but this is kind of a, a couple of slides to kind of put it in a nutshell here. But first you want to start off with a five to 10 minute warm up. Now this includes a general warm up, something like walking, 
jump rope, those types of things, rowing, whatever, that just essentially increases your heart rate, the actual temperature in your body, uh, those types of things gets the blood flowing. But then you're going to want to do a specific warm up at least for that first major movement of the day. So for example, you could do a full body type general movement based warm up or like I said on the row or something like that for five to 10 minutes. But then once you move on to squats, for example, you're obviously going to warm up, want to warm up within that movement as well. So that would be your specific warm up. And then you may have to do that for other movements uh, within the workout as well. Then you would move on to the first movements of the session should be power based if applicable. If you're doing power like plyometrics, Olympic lifts, those types of things, medicine ball throws, you should probably do that um, very early on in the session. Therefore, you get more out of it. Um, those muscles are a little bit more reactive. You're going to get a little more power output. Um, and then you would follow that with those major compound movements, so your major strength movements. So if you are not doing anything power-based, now you would be starting off with those compound movements, which again are the squat, the hinge, or some sort of deadlift, um, a bench, or a press, or overhead press, or, or something of that nature. So you want to start that session with the most um, important movement, the one that's going to require the most energy, the most hormonal response, the most muscles moved and, and worked and those types of things. And typically for any given session, regardless of the splits that we spoke on, you're probably only going to want to pick one to maybe three of these movements, especially when you're talking about training them for absolute strength, because otherwise um, you're probably just not going to get that much out of it if you if you do much more than that, just because if you're talking about maximal efforts from a power and absolute strength standpoint, you can only do so much in any given session. And then that would be followed by uh, some assistance and or accessory type movements. Now, these could be set up in the way of a circuit or supersets, meaning that you go from one movement to the next with absolutely no rest, and then you rest a little bit, and then you do that again, um, or any type of hypertrophy type movement. So that would be um, things that accessory movements are things that support the bigger movements. So uh, maybe your major movement is a back squat that day, but then you do some belt squats or some goblet squats to uh, support that squat. So kind of like back off type sets. Assistance movements could just be things where you are maybe doing shoulder prehab type stuff or movements that um, just kind of support um, the body that can help with with your overall goals. And then, like I said, as to how you set them up, there are a number of ways to do that. Now, moving on through the session, uh, next could be a good spot to put things like some finishers. So finishers would be terms uh, like basically shorter conditioning type things, things that we talked about that are very job specific, like carries, sled drags or pushes, uh, sandbag work, any type of ground work is great here, or any uh, abdominal lower back type movements as well, or even some of those shoulder move ha movements I, I mentioned. This would be a good spot for those types of things as well. And these finishers could last anywhere from three minutes to maybe 10 minutes. Minutes, you know, we're not talking about a lot of time here, um, something that is very um, efficient and, and good for the job. And then finally, if you are completing it in the same session, uh, this would be a good spot to add in the conditioning or aerobic work. Now, some people would consider, obviously, the carries and the sled work as conditioning, and that's fine. Um, and then maybe aerobic work could be on a whole other day, especially if you're talking about uh, long, slow distance type stuff where somebody's just taking walks for active recovery or for some, some base aerobic work or hiking on their days off, that kind of a thing. That, that could also be very applicable here. And then and then the last thing you'd want to do is that mobility work um, or stretching. Now, I will say mobility work. You could also, and we'll talk about mobility here in a moment, but that's kind of should be applied throughout the whole workout. But some people could, could basically do their mobility work as their warm-up as well and then do some mobility work at the end. But any type of static stretching should most certainly be done at the end of the workout. There's been numerous studies to show that you shouldn't static stress um, before a training session, whether that be um, aerobic based or strength based, because it can show to uh, reduce performance in most of the population. So um, the, the, the best time and the place for most mobility work and stretching would be at the end of the session. 
So I just wanted to do a little side note on actually choosing the exercises. I know we've hit on this several times, but as mentioned earlier, specificity uh, plays a, a large role and it's important. And those large compound movements probably should be prioritized for, for most individuals on the department. Um, again, because we all have a job to do and, and the job is the job. And so we, we, we kind of know where we get the most bang for our buck. Uh, but you do have to cater that to the individual uh, within reason. And those compound movements are best for absolute strength and certain aspects of power. Uh, like we spoke of. However, there is a place for smaller single joint type movements. Uh, this could be for hypertrophy purposes, accessory purposes like we talked about, and those prehab movements. So just because we are placing an emphasis on those compound movements doesn't mean that that's the end all be all. Obviously, those all those movements can can go around to make a more uh, balanced musculature, a more balanced individual, especially when dealing with prior injuries or imbalances, or or even just to support the major movements. Sometimes just doing the major movements alone are not enough for some individuals, so they have to do some other things to support it. Um, but you can also dive into Chapter 11 for more exercise options. They kind of go quite into the options and techniques. Although I will say it's interesting that they don't. Don't cover the back squat, although they mention the back squat several times, and I think it's a very efficient movement. Obviously, you want to do it correctly, as with any movement, but um, that's one thing that I would that I noted from that chapter. Um, but um, certainly look into that chapter. So uh, just for general options on on programming for for individuals and yourself. So I wanted to do another side note on uh, power training or training for power. We've mentioned it several different times, but uh, there is a whole chapter in the book, chapter 13, that that talks about training for power and plyometrics uh, specifically. Um, and now training for power can be done, as we mentioned, with with any major barbell movement, essentially adding speed to any major compound movement is a, one way to train for power. Um, you can also do it with sandbags or medicine balls, um, or you could do it with body weight via plyometrics. So basically anything is essentially jumping and different forms of jumping. Uh, and, the, and the book goes into plyometrics quite a bit, and they are great movements. Um, but it, for, for a lot of the population, they can be actually quite risky and higher in impact. So um, we have to kind of really weigh the pros and cons for plyometrics. So for certain individuals, it may be great, maybe may be game changing for others probably shouldn't do it at all so kind of um, kind of look into that as you as you think about programming those plyometrics sometimes they can be overdone or inappropriately uh, prescribed and now and one thing that i thought that was interesting that the book mentioned is this is a quote from the book tactical athletes should be able to back squat one and a half times body weight before performing uh, these plyometric drills and so that's going to eliminate quite a few people um, from uh, performing any plyometrics. So if, if you actually go by that standard, now it may be uh, a little bit on the conservative side, in my opinion. Um, however, it's probably not a bad rule of thumb for the average person. Again, you kind of have to um, to kind of weigh the pros and cons. Now, medicine ball throws can be quite safe when done correctly, but but jumping on, on different levels, um, especially like depth jumps and those types of things can be pretty high in impact. So just kind of weigh the pros and cons and um, and read that chapter so you have a little more knowledge about that. Taking all these things we've talked about into consideration, here's some specific considerations for firefighters um, when talking about programming. So these training sessions that are actually done at the station should probably not be the really high volume or the longest sessions for fairly obvious reasons. You may be interrupted quite often and or a lot of high volume can really beat somebody up and so therefore they're not uh, ready to perform at a moment's notice. Um, nor should they probably the most maximum intensity or maximal effort type thing. So you don't want to be doing a, a one rep max on something or even maybe working in the, the three rep max type vein um, at the station. Again, some people could probably get away with it, um, but a lot maybe would, would that would be taking a hit. And so if they got a call, for example, right after that effort, uh, they may not be worth a whole lot for several minutes or, or longer. So you want to be careful in doing that when when programming for them or when um, when they're talking to you about how they're working out. Uh, maybe those are some things that you can mention uh, that would that would probably be a good idea. Now, uh, the first day off also, uh, the first day off of the four should probably be a rest day or maybe uh, a light aerobic training day. Maybe they could uh, maybe a mobility day, those types of things. So um, with the assumption of getting a little bit hammered, even if they slept both nights, um, we know that we're kind of never really sleeping that well. We're always kind of on edge and always on the go and, and ready to respond. So um, that's that's kind of a good idea to have that first day of the four day, regardless of how you set up their programming, to probably be a, an off day at a minimum, if not.
not a um, a complete rest day or or like I said, light aerobic training day. And then uh, another good idea maybe to have the middle two days of the four day being the most intense sessions. So especially if you're doing that four day split, maybe the two days that are at the station are more of the lighter days or the speed days if you're doing conjugate, that type of thing. Whereas the middle two days are more of the heavier maximal effort type days. So they have more time on their off time perhaps and um, and if they if they do a really hard workout, they have more time to recover or the recovery is not going to impact something else that they may have to do, like responding on a fire, for example. So uh, just some considerations to uh, to take in um, for programming. OK, so we're going to wrap up the presentation by diving into mobility and stability. It's certainly not at the end of this presentation for lack of importance uh, for many individuals on our fire department. It could be the most important thing, especially to get them to their ultimate goals. Uh, some time maybe have to be spent here both before and after training sessions or for the training session itself. So uh, what is mobility? This is the coordination and efficiency of movement throughout joint range of motion. So this is actually the movement of the body throughout that range of motion while it's moving. So that is the difference than flexibility, which is the ability of muscles to go through the full range of motion about a joint. So think about it this way, comparing a overhead squat would be somebody that could do that efficiently, efficiently and well would be very mobile. However, a person that can do a really good sit and reach or just a static stretch would be flexible. Now, if you're going to put a little more priority on one or the other uh, from a performance standpoint, it would most certainly be mobility. And that would be more important than just static flexibility. However, if one has both, then that's a good thing as well. Um, uh, flexibility within reason, I would say. Um, now, the good thing is that this can be improved just by practicing good movement patterns in general uh, with their body weight and even under load. So you can literally be working on mobility all the time throughout your training session, throughout your day, just by doing good movement patterns all the time. Um, so when you're warming up, uh, you should be kind of thinking about your mobility. Maybe you're even doing some mobility uh, movements um, that help you out with your hip mobility or shoulder mobility or something like that. Um, when you're squatting and you on, even on your heavy loads, you should be working through a good quality range of motion with good movement patterns. So you are working your mobility. So the good thing is that mobility doesn't have to be necessarily an aside. It should be always there and, and always thought of and always practiced. So we can also improve mobility and practice mobility through static stretching and those that kind of that more flexibility type practice. Um, however, if you do this, this should be done after at the end of that training session, kind of like we mentioned earlier when we're talking about setting up your training session. Um, now, now just general active mobility, kind of active stretching is, has been seen to be a little bit better for performance than than the, the static or more passive type flexibility. However, there's a time and a place for both. And ultimately, you want to kind of cater the mobility and flexibility practice to the individual and their needs. There may be some that are almost too flexible in certain muscles and around a certain joint, um, and, they, and so they don't have stability there, uh, which we'll kind of go into here shortly. But um, in general, you want to you want to cater this to the person. Some people are going to have really tight hips versus somebody else who may have really tight shoulders. So therefore, you have to prioritize movements and kind of pick and choose your battles there. Um, and, and to really kind of dive into this further and to see a variety of static stretches, mobility routines, and even some foam rolling techniques, um, that starts on page 269 in the book. And this is all within uh, chapter 12. Now, in the way of mobility, here's some specific considerations for firefighters. This is some stuff that was brought up not only in the textbook, but brought up by Evan in the past from the medical division as well. So these are some common issues with mobility and stability that can lead to injury or lack of performance. So weak trunk stabilizers. So this would be like your abdominals, your erectors, or your transverse abdominals, which are kind of more um, underneath your abdominal wall. These are really important. This is kind of where the stability comes in. Stability can be practiced throughout all of our um, compound movements, essentially, and especially things like carries and groundwork and those types of things as basically having the ability to not only be mobile around a joint, but stable within a joint, especially under load. And so um, if you can strengthen your trunk stabilizer, 
stabilizers through those carries like we talked about through groundwork through just any compound movement uh, you're going to be better off and so sometimes that is overlooked and it's not necessarily done with crunches and sit-ups it's done with actual stabilization practice like isometric holds like planks or or those things where you're trying to uh, counter impose forces on you like in carries and, and those types of things uh, weak hip abductors so this is where your your abductors are actually spreading your legs or opening your legs those are typically weak on people where your adductors are typically tight so your inner thighs typically are tight so that causes knee problems ankle problems hips problems that type of stuff so people with weak uh, abductors and glutes which are very common um, that can cause a lot of problems so it's important to to strengthen in those things and of course stretch them as well so um, this can be attained sometimes just through squats and, and deadlifts and lunges and those types of things alone but sometimes you maybe have to dive a little deeper into some lateral movements uh, some band work that type of stuff um, weak external rotators and rear delts are also very common this would obviously lead to problems within the shoulder girdle and shoulder mobility so again some band work um, some prehab type stuff uh, would be very advantageous for that uh, weak and tight posterior chain. This is an extremely common, especially with males. Um, so it's not only a weakness where you're, uh, and we're talking about, you know, upper back, lower back, glutes, hamstrings, calves, all the way down the posterior chain can not only be weak, a lot of times they're undertrained, um, just because you tend to train the things you can see in the mirror sometimes, um, but also not only are they weak, but they are sometimes very tight. And so we need to get these muscles um, stronger and more mobile. And then as I mentioned, tight adductors are, are very common and can lead to to further problems, uh, reduction in performance, and further injuries. So some further mobility considerations. Now, when we're talking about these things and selecting these exercises for strength, stability, or mobility, make sure that these problem areas that we talked about are addressed. Um, most, of the, most of the time, you're going to have at least one, if not several, of those problem areas. And even if it's just to stay on top of them and not necessarily be reactive to an injury or reactive to a lack of performance, even just to be proactive and to stay on top of them, uh, it's a really good idea to do that. And it doesn't take that much time. These movements can be addressed um, during the warm-up as mentioned during the workout doing those prehab movements and those some of that band work um, there's a great video that Evan and the guys down at 3a put together on some of that band work alone and, and they address a lot of the shoulder things a lot of the hip stuff those movements can be done during the rest time between exercises um, just because you're resting doesn't mean you have to sit and do absolutely nothing you can be kind of doing some of this band time just make sure you're um, you're doing it at the appropriate rest times and not interfering with your with your work sets, obviously. Um, and then, as we mentioned before, post workouts great. And another great time to do it is just basically daily. So you're you're hitting it on those off days. Sometimes people feel better when they do mobility stuff on their day off, and maybe some light aerobic stuff or some interval aerobic stuff on their day off, as opposed to doing nothing. A lot of times that will allow for kind of flushing out the system, keeping the the body feeling good, keeping the body mobile, and then actually will allow for better performance in their next training session, especially their next strength training session, if they do that versus just do nothing at all. And so it can it can actually um, alleviate some soreness and, and those types of things. So there's lots of ways to sneak in this mobility work. It doesn't have to be that time consuming. Um, and it's just a matter of, of working with the individual, making sure we're meeting their needs and getting it done. So it was actually quite daunting uh, putting together this presentation because there's a lot of material to cover and I didn't want to take forever. For some of you, it's probably already been too long. Um, however, I wanted to make sure it was all inclusive and covering everything that uh, Evan wanted on the syllabus. But um, as I said, most of the stuff came from Essentials of Tactical Strength and Conditioning, the NSCA book that we all received. And it's a great book. So again, if you hopefully you've been following along in the book as you've been following along with this uh, with this presentation and and diving in deeper and you're probably going to have to has to have to use it as a reference book um, and, and reference it several times um, throughout helping people because you certainly can't remember everything but it's a, it's a good text and it's and it's well updated and good for the tactical populations but there's so many good books out there and honestly programming and diving into this stuff 
the more you dive into it, the more you realize you don't know, and the more you realize that everything works as long as you do it, and and everybody reacts to things a little differently. So it truly, it's not only a science to programming and helping individuals with their with their goals and their strength training goals and their aerobic goals, but there's quite honestly an art to it as well. And so sometimes that just takes time and effort and some practice and some diving into some stuff. So I would highly recommend not only diving further into the Essentials book, but diving into some other references that are well established, well known, and well referenced throughout the years and decades even. So here's just kind of a short list of some great books uh, that I've referenced throughout the years and that that many others do as well. Um, Starting Strength is a great book on just the basic barbell movements, kind of a go-to and I think a good foundation for, for most people. And then you can follow that up with practical programming for strength training. So it's from the same group of people, uh, Mark, Mark Ripito and company. Um, it's a great book for getting some programming ideas. And those are not like quick and easy reads by any means. None of these books really are, but they're, they're books to dive into and then probably have to read them again and read them again and reference and that kind of stuff. But if you really care about this stuff and want to help yourself and help others, uh, the, these, these would be great resources. The Science and Practice of Strength Training, uh, kind of a time-tested one. The Science and Development of Muscle Hypertrophy, a relatively new one, uh, Schoenfeld. They would obviously dive into more of the uh, bodybuilding and hypertrophy side of things. Uh, Scientific Principles of Strength Training is another newer text that's getting a lot of acclaim uh, by uh, Mike Zertel and company. A uh, good book there. And then Becoming a Supple Leopard is kind of becoming a, an instant classic by Kelly Starrett, that's uh, it's more in the uh, vein of mobility. So, and this is a sh- this is not all inclusive. Obviously, this is a short list of ones, um, but again, just dive into some some of this stuff. And if you really want to want to get into it further, uh, you can certainly ask me about some of these references as well and some of my experience. But um, but good good resources certainly and good references for the future. And we'll leave you with not only some uh, some good further reading and some good books to to reference, but some actual resources as well. Um, this is again not an all-inclusive list, but a short list of of individuals that I highly respect and many, many others um, in the same industry. Um, Dan John, it, he actually had some uh, Utah roots and he's still here, I believe. Um, a great strength coach, works with a lot of high school football teams. And what I like about him is the simplicity. Um, he likes to keep things simple, and most of the time, simple works. And simple does not mean easy; it just means simple, um, simple hard work. And so, a great Great resource has some stuff on the internet and some great books as well. Uh, Jim Windler uh, is, is becoming a lot more popular. That goes back to that 531 program. Again, worked for thousands and thousands, thousands of people. Uh, slow growth, very basic principles as well. A good resource. Uh, Mike Isertel and Chad Wesley Smith are in the the Juggernaut group. Um, they do a lot of good stuff with powerlifting and weightlifting and bodybuilding as well. So a good resource there. A lot of good stuff on uh, YouTube from those two. Kelly Starrett, as we mentioned, with the Supple Leopard book, but also has a lot of uh, good stuff online. Uh, Gray Cook is great for mobility and kind of rehab, prehab type stuff. Uh, has been around for quite a long time, has several good books um, and, and good resources there. Uh, Louis Simmons, pretty popular from his West Side Method. And then Matt Winning is kind of really coming into the scene, um, specifically with tactical populations. He's really working a lot with uh, military and fire um, and and some police as well. Um, he's got a good podcast as well. Um, he uh, they are both big proponents of the conjugate training and and then Matt Winning specifically conjugate training for tactical populations. So um, he has some good uh, uh, lectures in the um, NSCA uh, TSAC conferences as well. So a good resource there. You can find those online. Brad Schoenfeld was the kind of more the hypertrophy expert. And then finally, Andy Baker and Mark Ripito. These are the starting strength and practical programming uh, resources. They have some great stuff on YouTube. And again, simple programming that just has worked for a long time. So again, not an all-inclusive list, but some great references that if you haven't heard of some of these individuals, uh, they could be really good resources. And aside from reading more textbook type books, uh, another way to look at it is going online and looking at YouTube. And there's some there's some great ways to uh, find some information out there. So um, overall, that'll wrap up this lecture on strength and conditioning and training methods. As far as that module, I appreciate your time and attention. And of course, if you have any questions or concerns, feel free to hit me up uh, via phone or email. I will be around and uh, love to look forward to the rest of the training in this. Thank you.